All right, so welcome everyone. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce to a, our speaker today, Loic Landrieu, and just uh, some info about his background and his CV. So Loic graduated with a master of Ecole Polytechnique in Algorithmic and Applied Mathematics in 2011. He holds another two master degrees, actually, one from UNPC Paris Tech in Computer Science and Applied Mathematics, 2012, and another one, Machine Learning Computer Vision from Ernest Cachon. Um, he did his PhD thesis at UNPC Paris Tech in Enria under Francis Bach and Guillaume Obochinski, finished in 2016 in, on learning structured models and weighted graphs. And since 2015, he is the senior scientist at EGN and Paris in the Matisse lab in the Strudel. And I must say he was the first one to the best of my knowledge who developed a graph convolutional neural network approach for point cloud analysis. Maybe not, but <laughs> April, yeah, close to be the first. Um, that was very inspiring for the whole community at CVPR 2018. And I saw already within the last two and a half years got more than 400 citations. So fantastic work. Luik, um, we are pleased to have you and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. So as we will see, I was not exactly uh, exactly the first. I will talk about this. So thank you so much for having me here uh, virtually. So indeed, I'm a researcher at uh, IGN. Um, so I do mostly uh, machine learning and computer vision, but I have a focus on uh, large scale remote sensing applications. I work a lot for uh, with uh, 3D data for in urban scenes or forestry. I also work uh, with dynamic 3D when we have uh, X, Y, Z plus time. And uh, I am the main investigator of a INR grant called the Redis 3D uh, on this subject. Uh, I've also lately taken an interest in satellite image time series for crop mapping and uh, land use as well. So first, I'm going to talk about the context of 3D analysis, why it's important, and um, why it's particularly interesting to use deep learning for 3D data. Then I'm going to do a quick overview uh, of the methods that can be applied um, to, to, to use deep learning for 3D point clouds. Then I'm going to talk about my own work on how we can scale these methods to very large point clouds. And if I have time, I will talk about uh, other new uh, applications. So first, uh, 3D analysis. Uh, you've all heard of uh, deep learning. Uh, if, I, if, if I could make a very quick characterization of deep learning, it's a subfield of machine learning, where instead of, uh, of making the, uh, the descriptors by, uh, by hand, of using handcrafted descriptors uh, designed by experts, we instead give the raw data to a neural network which will create its own descriptors, which will learn its own descriptors along with the task uh, at hand. And so obviously you all heard how it's great for perception tasks like uh, image or sound music uh, processing. And also lately there have been some amazing results for language processing. For 3D data, it has taken a little bit more time. Uh, there was uh, almost five years uh, after the consecration of deep, deep learning for 2D and the start of deep learning for 3D. So we can wonder uh, why this is. Is there something fundamental about 3D data that makes it hard to apply deep learning to? Or is this just uh, implementation issues? And 3D uh, modality is uh, very popular right now in computer vision in particular. And I think there is three main reasons for that. The first is uh, technological. The sensor used to be very expensive and cumbersome, and now they are getting very small and uh, much cheaper. And they're also very, very efficient. Uh, there is new uh, technology called single photon LiDAR where a uh, sensor can detect a single photon by bouncing back on a surface. So it gives for amazing density and uh, the data that like, we never had before. And there is a prospect of very interesting industrial applications. Obviously autonomous driving, but also digital twin modeling for industrial facilities. And also earth monitoring can really benefit from the 3D um, modality. And as I will show, uh, it's a very dynamic uh, method methodological field. It's a very dynamic subfield of computer vision and machine learning. And the 3D modality is really becoming one of the uh, gold standard mod modality to try out new methods along with images on uh, text. 
So this combination of three factors means that uh, 3D modality attracts a lot of attention by both researchers and uh, um, industry. So now we can wonder what makes 3D data analysis so much harder than images. So if something works on an image on 2D, why can't it just uh, easily generalize to 3D? Well, the, uh, the first obvious thing is that uh, 3D point cloud tend to be very large. Well, an, an image in computer vision has at most uh, 1 million pixels. It's not uh, uncommon at all for 3D point clouds to be in the hundreds of millions of points. So of course, you, the scaling issues are, are really important. And uh, when designing the algorithm, it's very important to keep in mind how can we make it scale to a very large point cloud with reasonable memory and computational requirements. Another very obvious thing is that there is no regular grid. In an image, uh, for most pixels, there is a pixel above, below, right, and left. So we, get, we have really this nice grid that allows us to apply 2D convolutions with uh, uh, nice square kernels. It makes everything uh, uh, much nicer and easier. Here, you don't have a, re a regular grid. You have, you have points in 3D space, and uh, uh, there is no systematic systemic structure where the points uh, have a relationship with, with one another. It's much fuzzier. You also have permutation invariance. So this can, this can seem a little bit abstract, but actually it's uh, extremely important. So in images, the index of a pixel on its position uh, are int intrinsically linked. It's, a, it's the same thing. And if you permutate the indices of pixels, you permutate the position, and you just end up with RGB soup, and you, you can't do anything. You, lo you lose all the information. For 3D point clouds, what's important is the coordinates of the points, uh, and also maybe the color information, but not the index. You can index it however you want, and you can apply your permutation on the indices, and you have exactly the same data. So all the um, algorithms that you are going to use to, to learn the representation of 3D point clouds must be invariant by permutation of the indices. And this is actually quite an important uh, constraint. Then you have a, a sparsity. The data is sparse. So obviously, we have a collection of uh, zero-dimensional uh, objects, points in a 3D space. But uh, more uh, deep, deeply, uh, no matter what sensor you use, if you use stereo vision, if you use a LiDAR or a SLAM or something like this, you're only going to capture a surface, right? You're going to sample a surface in 3D space. So almost everywhere, there are no points, there are no information. And if you don't, if, if, if you don't think um, hard about uh, this constraint when designing your algorithm, you're going to spend a lot of time doing convolution in the air or in the emptiness, and you're going to, to waste a lot of memory and a lot of computation. So this is a very structuring constraint here. You also have a variable density. Here we, we see we are close to the sensor, and we have a very high uh, definition, very uh, uh, high precision for the road. But here we are more far away, and the road, uh, the acquisition is very sparse. We can even see the acquisition lines. However, this is road, and this is road just as just as much. So all the algorithms that you're going to use have to be very resilient to difference in uh, density. And we have acquisition artifacts, so all sensors do, but uh, particularly 3D point clouds, you can, for example, have a LiDAR that bounces back on the uh, dust or reflective surfaces like a car windows, um, makes things a little bit complicated. Or if you have moving objects, when you have a fixed LiDAR that's uh, rotating, um, you can have like really weird artifacts that uh, need to be taken into account. And you have occlusions. You also have occlusions for images, but for images, you have information for all pixels. And here, it's not the case. And it can be particularly jarring if uh, sub the, an object is close to the sensor, then you're going to end up with a big piece of the scene that is missing. And all the algorithm and networks that you're going to use have to be really resilient to big chunk of data missing. So those are the main reason why uh, 3D point clouds are a little bit harder to process with deep learning. But uh, the good news is it's nothing we can't overcome. And as we will see, there are a lot of great ideas on how to do that. I'm just going to talk extremely quickly about uh, traditional approach, so pre-deep learning in the ancient time of uh, 2017, how people used to, to process point cloud. So it's a very standard machine learning approach. You consider each point. You compute handcrafted descriptors of the geometry, radiometry, et cetera. You feed them to your favorite classifier, uh, which is random forest. 
And uh, you, uh, you will end up with a, usually a kind of poor quality classification, but you can improve this by increasing the special regularity, either you're using graphical models or maybe structural optimization, et cetera. So th this does okay, but uh, it turns out uh, that uh, experts and uh, researchers are not so good at uh, devising uh, handcrafted descriptors, and it's much better if you have enough data to let a neural network learn its own descriptors that is that are more fitted to, to your task. This leads us to deep learning for our 3D point clouds. So our objective here is to have a 3D point cloud and to feed it to a neural network to learn a representation, a vector that describes the, the 3D point clouds. But first, we need to define the input in a, we need to format it in a, in a correct way. So the most obvious one is we can consider a 3D point cloud as a set of images taken in different directions. We have images, they are easy to process. We can also discretize the 3D space uh, with the voxels, so the 3D equivalent of uh, pixels, and then look, look at which um, voxels have points in them and which are empty. Another way is to devise a convolutional uh, a convolution scheme that can be applied to 3D point cloud. And then you can consider your 3D point cloud as a convolutionable structure, meaning that you can learn local uh, local features from the point clouds. Another a little bit more abstract way of uh, uh, representing a point cloud would be to use a graph. You can connect each point to its neighbors and you have a 3D graph that is embedded in a 3D space. And lastly, you can consider a point cloud as a, another set of points, so not a list, not an array, but a set of points uh, in, that is invariant by uh, permutation. So those are the, the, the main way to format a, a point cloud, and uh, they all lead to a um, very interesting uh, neural network. So the most obvious approach, and um, which was uh, actually the first that uh, really worked and scaled a little bit on 3D point cloud, was um, uh, came from the observation that neural uh, network and in particular convolutional neural networks are really great at analyzing images, and we can leverage this by simply taking pictures of our scene. So first we do a surface reconstruction, then we take virtual snapshots. So we randomly or maybe a little bit smarter than this, we can pick a, a camera position and parameters, and we take pictures of our scene. We feed them to CNN, which is trained to do a pixel prediction that we can project back to the 3D point clouds. And so this works uh, well. It's a little bit complicated because you have to do all those steps. And also, by uh, taking images of a 3D scene, you lose a little bit of structure. And so it's not the, the, the end, uh, uh, it's not the best solution. But it was the first one and that really showed that deep, deep learning can be uh, applied to 3D point clouds. Another uh, generalization, so it's uh, also observe, ob observing that uh, conversational neural network are very efficient on images, which are regular two degrees. Why can't we just do a regular three degrees? And um, so, of course, you can do this. You discretize this, um, your input, and then you apply the 3D con conversational net. So instead of connecting uh, pixel to its eight uh, neighbors in the previous feature map, you connect each voxel to its 27 neighbors if you use a three by three by three uh, kernel. So this works okay, but this has obvious limitations. It's very uh, inefficient. Uh, you have cubic memory re requirements, which means that uh, if you want to multiply your resolution by, um, by, by two, you're going to um, multiply the size memory requirement by, uh, by eight and also as we said, the data is sparse, so most voxels are empty. So if you do things um, a bit uh, naively, you're going to do convolution in the air and uh, uh, waste a lot of mem memory. So a first approach would be to use an adaptive voxelization. So you can use an octree where you have larger uh, voxels where you don't have information and smaller voxels where the information uh, is present. So this works. Uh, sorry. This, and, um, an issue with this is now you have to do uh, convolution in an uh, octree structure, which is not exactly easy, but it can be done. Um, you also have issues with uh, orientation, where a small change in the orientation can change uh, your tree structure a lot. So it's a little bit hard to learn, but it's entirely possible and it's a very reasonable approach. Then you have the set cloud approach, um, observing that uh, you can very easily do um, 
3D convolution on a discretization, but you cannot have two um, voxels that are too small. You first uh, compute a, a rough voxelization of your scene, which gives you an idea of uh, what is what. And then you do sub voxel pre prediction. So here in SecCloud, they use a tree neural interpolation with a CRF, but it doesn't really matter. The idea is you just use a voxel grid to give you a view of the scene, and then you do things inside the voxels to, to overcome the limitation of the discretization. So also uh, quite a good idea. And now you have the most uh, more modern approaches, uh, SplatNet, Minkowski, Net, uh, SparseConv, et cetera. So it's an idea uh, that's very obvious that uh, to observe that if a voxel does not have a point in it, you know it's empty. So you don't have to compute an embedding for it. So you can only select the um, voxels that have points and only compute uh, embedding for those, for, for those uh, vo voxels. So you don't have to embed all the other voxels. And so you, by, by doing this, because your data is sparse, um, you end up by uh, saving a lot of memory and a lot of computation. So the idea is, is very simple. It's actually quite tricky to implement efficiently. Uh, it's a sparse matrix multiplication. And um, so there are a lot of competing uh, implementations by uh, very, very good developers. And actually, even though the idea uh, existed for, for a while, we, uh, we had to wait to have uh, very competent developers that uh, uh, made very efficient implementation for this idea to, to, to really work. And now the implementations are so efficient that uh, you can actually have uh, such small voxels that uh, the discretization is not uh, an issue so much anymore. A uh, big benefit of this approach is that you can use a lot of the insight from 2D to 3D um, because it's just uh, adding an extra dimension to your kernels. If your favorite uh, uh, convolutional neural network is, I don't know, ResNet 50, for example, it's very easy to uh, transfer your ResNet 50 from images to 3D, and you can use a lot of the uh, fa fancy tricks developed by um, image process processing uh, directly to 3D. So it's very easy to parameterize and uh, uh, quite easy to understand how it works. Then you have another generalization, so it's a little bit more abstract. Uh, it's to observe that uh, you can consider CNN on a regular grid as discrete convolutions. And we want to generalize this to continuous convolutions or convolutions in continuous space. So quick, quickly, a uh, quick reminder of uh, what it means to do convolutions in, in a 2D regular grid. You want to embed a point. You look at the features of uh, its neighbors in the previous feature map. And you multiply each feature, um, depending on the offset with respect to the point that you're considering, with a kernel, right? So it, it, a kernel defines a weight for each offset. And you multiply the features with the corresponding offset. And you sum everything. And this is what a convolution is. But what can you do if uh, the points live in continuous space, if they're not uh, nicely position at discrete offsets. Well, um, then obviously this cannot, this cannot happen because there is no reason for a point to be exactly above and exactly on the left or on the right, which is why you can do continuous convolution. So the idea is that you select um, offsets that, offset that are continuous. Your kernel is uh, com comprised of uh, uh, points which have 3D coordinates and weights as well. And for when you want to embed a point, you consider its neighbors. And for each point of the kernel, you're going to consider all the neighbors and multiply their feature by the kernel weight. But you're going to weight this by a proximity function, which means that the points that are close to the kernel are going to participate more in this sum. And you do this for all the kernels and um, all the kernel points. And you sum everything, and you end up with a continuous convolution. You can remark that if you positioned your kernel point uh, at the offset of a regular grid, and if your proximity function is a Kronecker function, so equal to 1 in 0 and 0 everywhere else, you end up exactly with a discrete convolution. So it's really, truly uh, a generalization from discrete to continuous. Of course, you're not going to use just a triangle uh, to position your kernel points. Uh, so typically, you can use uh, the vertices of regular polyhedra, but you can also learn the position of uh, the uh, kernel points. And likewise, for the proximity function, you can use like a regular radial uh, fun 
function that decreases with uh, this distance, or you can also learn this. So this is a, a really good idea that was de developed uh, almost simultaneously by uh, two researchers, uh, Uke Thomas and Alexandre Bush. And uh, so it's a very powerful network. I think it's a little bit harder to develop an intuition uh, about the kind of architecture that works well, but uh, it is really absolutely state of the art and a really, a really smart idea. Lastly, you have the graph graph uh, graph based methods. So another generalization. Um, it's noting that uh, you can consider the convolution in two D as graph convolutions in a in a graph that simply connects the each pixels to its neighbors. So you have uh, this nice regular lattice uh, structure. But surely, if you can do convolutions in this type of graph, you can generalize the notion of convolutions to any type of graph. And uh, 3D point clouds can easily be um, uh, considered as a graph by simply connecting each point to its neighbors. So uh, I'm not going to give an exhaustive view on a graph conversion because it's a very active field of uh, machine learning. But just very quickly, you start by initializing each vertex, so each point, with um, an, uh, an initial descriptors of uh, its uh, geometry, color, etc. And then you have a, mes a message passing scheme. So each vertex sent to it neighbor its neighbors a message that depend on the content uh, of its um, current representation. So the, the, the point syncs, um have an idea of uh, what, what it is or of its inner representation, and it sends a message to neighbors, making them know um, what the point sync it is. And once all the message has been sent, uh, each vertex listen to all the messages that it has received and pull them. You can use max pooling, mean, sum, et cetera. It doesn't matter. And now you have an idea of the context. And the points, the vertices, improve their inner representation by considering the current representation and the messages from that describe the context. And you do this iteratively, you do this uh, a, a lot of times. And so the, the receptive field of uh, the points increase and it gets a, an idea of what it is based on uh, its local features, but also uh, on the context. So this is a general idea. There exists uh, something like 50 different uh, uh, graph convolution schemes, but this would be the, the simplest one. One that I uh, really like and uh, is um, particularly relevant to 3D point clouds and has been uh, uh, applied way before uh, uh, I did it is uh, Martin Simonovsky uh, ID to add edge filters. So now the messages that are sent by uh, the points depend on edge features. So uh, a point will not send the same message to a neighbor that is closed than to a neighbor that is far away. And it will not send the same message uh, in the upper direction than a, a lower direction, for example, which is quite important because you, uh, for 3D point clouds, you just don't have a graph. You have a graph that is embedded in 3D space. So it's really important to consider the, the special relationship between points when sending messages. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about PointNet. So historically, it was actually uh, the first uh, network uh, they developed for 3D point cloud. But I, I kept it for the end because it's such a, a particular net network. It doesn't really, contrary to the, to the other ones, um, it doesn't come from the observation that uh, conventional neural networks work so well for 2D. How can we apply this magic to 3D? It's a complete dif completely different idea, a very simple idea, but that doesn't come from the image processing community, really. Uh, but it's very important work. So the idea is to consider that the permutation invariance property of 3D point clouds is actually uh, the most important one. And so this is how it works. You, you have points and that are described for, for example, their position, or you can, you can also add their color, right geometry, uh, reflectance, et cetera, et cetera. And you learn a point, a point function that will uh, learn an embedding uh, representation of each point. And then you stack everything. So this is not permutation invariant, right? If you swap P1 on Pn, you swap F1 on Fn. So this is not permutation invariant. But then um, you do a max pooling, so you do a, ma a maximum in the point dimension. So for each coordinate of the point function, you're going to only keep the value uh, for the points that give the highest value. And this, this will uh, give you a vector, 
which is invariant by permutation. If you swap P1 and Pn, you swap F1 and Fn, this has, this has no effect whatsoever on G. Um, so this can be considered as a global shape descriptor. And then if you want to do classification, uh, you can just learn another network that will map this uh, um, vector to, for example, a vector of class uh, logits or something like this. If you want to do point-wise point uh, prediction, it can very be very easily adapted as well. So very simple idea, it takes like five lines to, to, to code the, the important parts, and uh, it works surprisingly well. Um, it has a lot of uh, really nice properties as well. For example, if you consider the shapes, it has a lot of points. And however, not all points uh, could contribute to the global shape descriptors, right? Because if a point um, as, uh, doesn't have the highest value for any coordinate of the point function, you can remove it and it doesn't change the shape descriptor whatsoever. So basically you can remove all the points that do not contribute to the global shape descriptor through the maximum. And I, um, you, you, you haven't changed the global shape descriptor at all. On the contrary, you can, um, there are many points and you can add to, uh, to your point cloud. And as long as they don't change G, as long as they don't have the highest value for uh, any coordinate of the point function, it doesn't change the shape at all. So all these three shapes, uh, so this kind of uh, skeleton looking, and this one looks a little bit like a surface reconstruction, um, they're very different, but they have exactly the same shape descriptors. So, so in a way, you can say that the robustness to density variation is built in into the network. Uh, it's not learned, it's really, it's built in. So um, this is why I think like it's such a, a nice idea, but with a, a very deep pr properties. And there is a reason why uh, it is a gold standard of uh, um, 3D point cloud net networks, even though it's, it's starting to be a bit old in, the, in term of uh, deep learning where three or four years uh, is actually a long time. So now you have all those, um, all this arch architecture to learn a point representation. So how how we can how can we apply them? How can we organize uh, them into a network that can process a larger point clouds? So it's very similar to what is done in uh, um, for for images. So you have your point clouds, and each point have uh, these descriptors corresponding to their position, their color, etc. You subsample the point cloud. And then for each point of the subsample point cloud, you're going to consider the neighboring in the full resolution point cloud. So now you can associate to each point of the subsample point cloud a set of points. You compute an embedding using PointNet or Capiconv or whatever. And um, this gives you an, uh, an embedding of the local geometry and real geometry for the subsample point cloud. And then you do this uh, again, and now you have combination of combination um, of the input fee features. So it's exactly like in a 2D CNN where you trade off special resolution for semantic content. And if you want to do uh, point cloud classification, you do this until you have just a single point that captures all the information from, from the shape. And if you want to do point, um, point cloud classification, you can do a simple unit structure by uh, using up sampling instead of down sampling and skip connection, etc. It's very straightforward from images um, to 3D. So we go from local to global, right? So further we go on the, on the right, um, the more um, we, we, we use uh, special resolution that we, we gain semantic insights. OK, so now I'm going to, to talk about how we can uh, scale these ideas to truly large pop point clouds. So all the methods that I've uh, uh, mentioned previously are uh, really uh, nice ideas and great networks, but they don't they do not scale so well. They're limited to let's say to be generous 100,000 points at once, which is nowhere near the scale um, of large 3D point clouds. So you, you there is different strat strategies. Well, you can do sub sampling. But uh, if the first step of your machine learning uh, algorithm is to discard 99.9% .9 of the information, usually you're, you're not in a, in a good place. You can use a sliding window. So you can uh, consider, for example, a cube of, uh, I don't know, two by two by two meters and uh, have it uh, go everywhere. And for each cube, you use uh, your favorite uh, neural network. So this can work quite nicely, but you lose the global structure for some uh, 
type of data, it's not so much an issue. Um, for example, for indoor segmentation, that's not too bad. But uh, here, for example, if you want to know that this is a bridge and not a road, it's actually quite important to have a global ID, which is uh, what we followed in superpoint graph. So observation is that here we have 40 million points, but in the, so which is a lot of points, but in the end, the scene is not so complicated, right? Um, just have a, a road on a few buildings. So if for some reason, uh, if we are able to do a partition uh, into simple shapes that we call super points by an analogy to super pixels, and we analyze each super points, and uh, we can also analyze the global structure with a global adjacency graph so here uh, that just denotes the adjacency between super points, then we can have a global um, class classification of all the super points and hence of all the points. So basically, uh, we've broken down the semantic segmentation of large point clouds into uh, three steps. The geometric partition, where we uh, partition the point cloud into uh, simple shapes, into super points. Um, so this is a little bit, little bit costly because we have to consider all the points. But then we have to embed each super point independently. Since their shapes is simple by construction, we can subsample them a lot. So it's very, very cheap. And then the contextual segmentation, we have a graph with something like 1,000 nodes and 10,000 edges, which is nothing. This can be done almost instantly on a commercial GPU. So um, you can note that only the first step considers, considers the entire point cloud, and uh, the rest just operates on a much, much smaller stru structure, usually four or five uh, orders of magnitude smaller. So just to reiterate, here we have a toy scene uh, of a table and a chair. We can first do a partition into simple shape to compute the adjacency between the shapes, embed each um, super point with your favorite network. So here we just use point net because it's simple. And then uh, each shape is going to send messages to the other to let them know of the context. And after some iterations, this allows us to classify the super points and uh, uh, to have very good results. How do we do the partition? Um, well. First, we compute for each point uh, handcrafted descriptors of its local geometry and radiometry. For example, the wall is flat and vertical and white. And then we compute a piecewise constant approximation of this signal on an adjacency graph. So this means that we're going to put together points that are adjacent and have the same color and same geometry, which is reasonable. And uh, we can find an approximate solution of this problem with the L0 calculation algorithm, so developed with uh, Guillaume Brzezinski, and later with uh, Hugo Rage. We have a few publications on this. Um, so it's a very efficient algorithm that's parallel graph cuts. It's a very fast to compute this kind of partition. So the problem is all the errors that you do in the partition will bleed into the classification because you never consider points anymore. You just classify um, 3D, 3D point clouds. So a legitimate, legitimate question is, is it possible to learn to partition? And it turns out that you just need to learn a point embedding, so a representation of the local geometry of each point, such that it is homogeneous within objects and have high contrast at the border. Because if you have this, when you compute the approximate uh, piecewise constants approximation, uh, then the, party, the super points are going to uh, closely follow um, the borders of objects. And this can be learned with a simple contrastive uh, uh, loss. It's actually a quite a easy metric learning uh, problem to, to, to learn. And uh, this leads to very nice super points that really follow um, the controls of objects and are much better than the state, state of the art of uh, super point, uh, 3D super point methods because it's a, it's a learning method and the others are not. Here on the autonomous uh, drive, uh, driving the data set, you can see, so this is the embeddings, not here. This is the, the ground truth objects. And you can see something interesting. Uh, you have a tree where the trunk is surfacic and uh, brown, and the foliage is green and volumetric, so very different geometry. Yet the network learns that they are usually the same objects, and so it learns a similar embedding. And when we do the um, uh, piecewise constant approximation, we have a one-to-one -one partition of trees whereas the other methods really struggle with the complex geometry of the foliage. So I'm going to go very quickly over the quantitative results. Uh, the short uh, story is that when we released Superpoint Graph, it was quite a big improvement over the state of the arts, which have been uh, uh, caught up uh, uh, since. If you learn the partition, you improve the result a little bit. 
But now there are networks, for example, the very large um, ConvNet, 3D ConvNet, or the point, uh, point convolution, which are so efficient, uh, so large, with so many parameters that it becomes quite hard to overcome even the tiny, the tiny errors made in, uh, um, in the super points. But uh, SPG is a tiny net network with only a couple hundred thousand parameters. The so learning only takes a, a few hours instead of a whole days. So it, it has its uh, it has its use. But if you want to really truly set up the art results, you should probably use KPConv or Minkowski Net. Uh, okay, so this is the result on the autonomous driving data set on a very large outdoor uh, point cloud with over two billion points. So in practice, which network should you use? Um, I think you should always start with a, a classic uh, method, just you know, just to clean your data because uh, it can be quite hard to debug with uh, deep learning. But that's uh, besides the points. I think you should use a simple point net or point net plus plus with a sliding window strategy, just to give you an idea of what's going on. It's very interpretable and um, it can give you an, an an idea of the ballpark of the performance that you can uh, expect. And then you ask yourself, why is my net, uh, this network not performing better? Is this because my data is uh, complicated and my task is very subtle, so I need a more powerful network? Then you can move on to the point conversion or the uh, very efficient 3D components. If the problem is that it's way too way too long and you're missing the global structure, then you can use a, a super point graph method, uh, which you, and of course you can combine both. Uh, so super point graph is open source; you can ch check it out. Um, so if you actually uh, do the implement these methods, you're going to quickly realize how hard and um, full of traps coding uh, deep learning for 3D point clouds is. And there is a simple reason for that, that for images, you have a great standardization uh, framework like uh, Torch Vision that makes life so much easier. But this, is, this uh, didn't exist for 3D point clouds which is uh, why with uh, some uh, uh, colleagues and developers, we've developed um, TorchPoint 3D, which uh, is meant to be the Torch vision of 3D. It's a completely open source repository for 3D deep learning for researchers, but it's also ready for productization because the developers are not researchers. They used to be in the industry, so their coding skills are much, much better than a, a standard researcher. Um, we support multiple tasks, so classification, segmentation, detection, panoptic segmentation, and registration, and with more more to come. And for each one, we have uh, metrics um, and losses that have been uh, tried and tested by a, a very fast-growing com community. And it's very easy to make a mistake in uh, metrics and completely invalidate uh, your, re your results. I speak from experience. So uh, if you use this framework, you have at least a guarantee that um, a lot of people have used uh, the main metrics and have uh, found uh, possibly all the bugs that, uh, that, that were there. Um, the developers have also reproduced a lot of uh, state-of-the-art network, so all the ones that I've uh, talked about and so on, uh, even more. Um, and it was actually quite complicated to reproduce the results, but uh, luckily all the authors uh, of these papers are very committed to reproducibility and help the developers to achieve the same results presented in the papers, which is always uh, reassuring. And so why is it so great to have all those uh, backbones, all those network into the same framework? Well, it's hard to know which uh, algorithm is going to be the best for your applications. And you have all these repositories on the internet, but they, they have different data loaders, different philosophies, so it's hard to make them talk together. If you use uh, TorchPoint 3D, you just need to make one of the backbone work, for example, a simple one like Point Net++. And then you can very easily swap it for more modern network, like Minkowski Engine or CapiConf, for example, and you can find the perfect backbone network for your very specific task. Uh, it's also complicated to add a new, new data, data sets to try your network on new data set, and which is why most papers in 3D point, uh, 3D point clouds only consider a couple. But now uh, there are a lot of them, uh, just those one, but also may, many more uh, that are accessible and directly uh, uh, accessible on TorchPoint 3D. And you can download the data, clean it from the known errors, and uh, process it, and even uh, do the submission on the submission servers uh, for uh, when it's the case directly in Python. 
And uh, so maybe uh, you're not too used to 3D point clouds, uh, uh, to deep learning development. Then uh, with TorchPoint 3D, you can directly uh, train a network with a single line of code. It just, uh, it just uh, um, specifies the task and the model type and the data sets. And you can also mo modify the network by using a, a very easy to use and vers versatile system of configuration file. So you can do everything in text. You don't even have to look at code. And you can go quite far just by editing uh, the configuration files. OK, so I'll be quick for the last uh, part. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, a very, very recent work uh, that I did with a student on uh, Mathieu Aubry, which is uh, another uh, researcher on string 3 d clouds, and uh, one of his students as well. And our problem was how to visualize a large collection of shapes in an unsupervised way. For example, you can be a company, you scan all your equipment, and maybe you acquired a very large library of CAD models, like the ABC dat data set, and you want to be able to make sense of it in an unsupervised way. So this is reminiscent of clustering. In machine learning, when you have a program like this, usually you do clustering to group together the elements. So here's a shape that uh, looks similar. And for each group, for each cluster, you're going to look at the centroid to, to let you know what's inside the, the cluster. So this doesn't work uh, for 3D point clouds for a few reasons. First, if you consider, uh, so this is the same chair with different world rotation and scalings. And if you compute the pairwise distance using a classic uh, um, distance between point clouds, you're going to find that they actually have quite a large distance, even though it's the same chair. And this chair, for example, will be closer to uh, an object that is not a chair, but has the same orientation. So if you don't have a meaningful notion of pairwise distance between objects, it's going to be hard to do clustering. But let's imagine that somehow you are able to group together all the shares in your data sets, and you want to, to visualize uh, the content of the cluster. So if you simply do an average, you're going to end up with something very messy, even if you solve the alignment uh, problem. For example, some chairs have armchair and some have not. And if you do the average, you're going to end up with a weird thing that looks like nothing and is not present in uh, uh, any, any chairs. So this is an issue, which is why instead, of uh, computing a centroid shape, we use a linear shape family. So linear shape family is uh, defined by a center shape, which uh, characterizes the content of the family. And then you have an alignment network, which is uh, when you try to compute the distance between a uh, linear shape family and an input point cloud, can output a transformation to be applied to the center shape to uh, align uh, both shapes. So this resolves essentially the problem of uh, rotation and scaling, etc. Um, so now you have a meaningful distance. And also, we add a displacement field. We learn a displacement field. So each point has a direction that it can explore. And uh, if you move all the points along the displacement field, you, you are still on the linear fa family, right? And you can also have more than one displacement field, of course. So it means that, in a sense, a linear shape family is a low dimensional affine subspace of the space of all shapes. And if we look what it looks like um, in practice, so this is trained on a, a ShapeNet data, data set in a completely unsupervised way. At no point have we tell the model what it means to be a plane. And it recognizes that there is a, a lot of shapes that can, that can be described by this family. So you have a plane. And if you move along this direction, you change the number of engines and the shape of the, of the tail. And if you move along this direction, it looks more or less like a jet fighter. For example, here, this. Uh, table, if you move along this direction, you change the, the height of the legs, and here are uh, the widths. So it's just that the models have noticed that uh, if you take a chair uh, table, sorry, and, and you explore this direction, you're going to be able to cover a lot of ground. A lot of shapes are going to be close to this uh, linear shape family. And this can be learned with uh, just a single loss. It's, uh, it's quite easy. And what can be used, uh, what can you use it for? So for example, uh, the, so the shape net data set of 50,000 shapes. Uh, so it will take uh, days to really understand what, what's in, what, uh, in, in the set. And here, uh, these are some of the linear shape families that we've learned. This is the center shapes. And for example, even though we have never given it any semantic information, the network have noticed that there are three types of planes in the, the data set, a jetliner, an old-timey plane, and a, on a, a, jet, a jet fighter. 
So this can give you uh, uh, just a glimpse of uh, uh, with just uh, one look uh, the idea of what's inside the, the large collection of shapes. And if you want to do semantic segmentation, you can also use this. Um, so if you want to classify all the points, you actually just have to annotate the center shapes of which you have, I don't know, maybe something 20 or 30, maybe up to 50. And if you annotate the center shapes, it's very easy to propagate the point label from the center shapes to shapes that are close to the corresponding linear shape family. And if you do this, you obtain absolutely set of the art uh, results. And uh, so this is a grand choice and this is our prediction. So you can see it's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite good. And you can only do this, you can do this by only annotating a few center shapes, which is easy to visualize. So it's interpretable and um, quite uh, quite efficient for semantic uh, segmentation and to visualize large collection of shapes. So I'm going to skip this because I don't really have time. So this is the end. Uh, so I haven't talked about uh, a lot of things. There are so many networks. I think the elephant in the room is uh, clearly the three D transformers here. So transformers are a new type of architecture that has been initially developed for natural language processing, has been recently adapted to images, and now everybody wants to adapt them to uh, 3D point clouds, uh, being included. So this is a very promising end endeavor, and I think we're going to see uh, another increase in performance very soon. Also, a lot of uh, excitement around semi self or unsupervised learning. So it's very annoying, very tedious to annotate 3D point clouds. So if you are able to make your own supervision, for example, by uh, uh, guessing the orientation and removing part of a 3D point cloud, this can be uh, this can be great. Uh, some of the work I'm doing now is domain adaptation, where we can learn a single network, teach a single network from different uh, uh, modality and sensors. So we do multi-source and uh, multi-task learning where a single network can consume different modalities and out, uh, output different tasks. So this is it for me. Uh, these are some of the open source repository I've talked about and uh, my website. Yeah, all right. So thank you so much, Loïc. Uh, David, shall I do the moderation of the question and answers, or did you want to do that? I, it's, it's up to you. Okay, I, I will just go ahead. Then. So thank you so much. That was very exciting. Um, are there any questions for Luik? Oh, I see Robert raising his hand. What you want, and then Miles. So Robert, want you to go first, and then Miles. Actually, Miles, I think, raised his hand first, so I would give him the, the first question, if you don't okay. mind, John. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, so I, I have one comment and then one uh, question, I guess. Uh, the comment's more like an observation, but I just thought it was interesting how essentially the uh, the convolutions on the 3D point net kind of mimic uh, SPH, like these Lagrangian methods and computational fluid dynamics, which I think is very cool. So mm -hmm. they seem very similar, kind of the method by which, you know, you kind of perform these, these you know, radial basis kernel methods and stuff. Uh, my question is more for these different methods, and some of them are quite computationally intensive. Um, most of these computer vision tasks are happening on essentially, you know, uh, bare metal. So for self-driving cars, uh, autonomous UAVs and stuff, you have very limited hardware, um, you know, essentially power or, you know, computational power. So which one of these do you think will be most useful for, you know, kind of these, these deployed uh, algorithms uh, that really need to, to be fast? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, they, they definitely there are uh, research uh, papers where the goal is to gain a half a point uh, uh, over the state of the art to be able to, to publish. But a lot of this net network, you, you can make them much more efficient, much smaller, and still retain a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, performance. I think probably the superpoint approach can be used to, uh, for really fast uh, to, to, to increase the speed of uh, inference and the memory requirements. But uh, with uh, modern uh, modern hardware, and uh, for example, there was a lot of excitement about uh, the possibility of using um, FPGA, field programmable arrays. Uh, so basically, programmable chips that can really um, 
that are much faster than GPUs and, and consume a lot less en energies. So um, I think this can probably solve a lot of the issues that we that we would have uh, with de deploying large neural network on uh, for autonomous driving, for example. Great, thanks. Hey, uh, so really interesting talk, very dense, uh, so lots of information yeah. in there. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I was also uh, intrigued by this, by this, by these different point cloud methods, and uh, you know, as Miles already mentioned, um, so uh, you know, in astrophysics, uh, but also it's more generally in fluid dynamics, um, they are of course particle based methods uh, to model the fluids. And so I was wondering, is there a chance that one can use these methods that are, it seems at least at the moment, more clearly designed to, you know, to identify more like solid objects, uh, also in like fluid dynamic applications? So I don't know a lot about fluid dynamics, but uh, so I am working with uh, students. Uh, so I have a, a, a project on applying this method uh, to developing uh, networks on dynamic 3D. So when we have uh, X, Y, Z plus time. So this is typically, so in our, in our project, we are more thinking about the case of a, a driving car, which uh, a sensor that uh, is rotating and uh, doing an acquisition, while the, in, a, in a world that is moving and the, and the sensor is moving and it's even rotating, so a very complex uh, uh, acquisition geometry. Uh, we so yeah, uh, for example, cars and pedestrians are mo moving. So um, yeah, so definitively, this is, uh, there are ways uh, to apply this method to 4D. Uh, but I don't think it's entirely clear right now how to, how to do this. It's really developing work, but it's clearly the next uh, the next frontier. So yeah, okay, thank you. Add something to this. So there is some work on uh, graph convolution neural networks for fluid dynamics for hydrological applications. For example, from Google DeepMind, Peter Battaglia. And so, so they are working on introducing Navier-Stokes equations and, and, and learning basically um, deep nets and GCNs, mostly for computer graphics approaches. So the computer graphics community, they have also general adversarial networks and GCNs for fluid models since a bit two years. So there's, I know about some roughly works that do that. So yeah, it, 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 it's existing, but it's a new field. Uh, maybe if I can just follow up on Robert's thing there. I mean, so one of the, the obvious things that comes to mind for kind of the crossover would be maybe like uh, galaxy identification, morphological identification. And so this, you know, this, this thing you showed with the rotation of the table and the chairs and how to deal with kind of this, this issue. Um, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head what would be the obvious kind of, you know, way to handle this, but it would be very interesting to see if this is applicable um, to this very difficult problem of like, you know, galaxy, uh, galaxy morphological classification. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't really know because I mean, we're looking at it from, you know, essentially we have a 2D view of these galaxies, whereas here it seems you have more of a 3D uh, kind of depth to these. Right. So um, this paper uh, that we just did is uh, the, the main idea uh, of learning to, to, to transformations to do a meaningful clustering from a, a huge amount of the data that we need to, order to organize. Uh, actually, there was a previous paper by uh, Mathieu Aubry on uh, um, Tom Monet, they did this in 2D uh, with very interesting results. I think it was published at uh, last Norris, I think. And so if the data are 2D, I think it's definitely worth to check out uh, uh, what they did in 2D. 2D has its own challenges um, and 3D as well, but uh, they showed that it's possible to organize the very large collection of images uh, into something that can uh, be meaningful, uh, uh, that you can just interpret with just uh, one look. Okay, so maybe first Sheng Yu and then Joachim, if I see that correctly. Sheng Yu. Uh, hi, hi Louis, Thank, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I, beyond uh, the representation or convolutions you mentioned here in the slides, I now I think interfunction is super popular, right? Since you're after NERF, there are so many works uh, uh, about these 
uh, in representations. And this year, uh, for CVR 2021, there are at least three papers on this for in scene reconstruction. And uh, there are already proof of concept papers showing that these interfunction could also be used for downstream tasks like semantic semantics, like point-wise labels. Um, so uh, do you see any problem with these interfunctions that might uh, uh, mm, like limit its wide application? For example, encoding high frequency information, right? Because some, some interfunction is quite smooth and uh, it's overfitting to a uh, uh, observed surface. But beyond these high frequency information encoding, or do you see any other problems, or do you have any comments on this topic? Uh, for which uh, which scheme ex exactly are you referring to? Uh, image function. It's like occupancy network, deep FTF, these works, and also oh. nerve neural radiance field network. Uh huh. Um... Well, for the occupancy network, uh, this uh, this I, I I know we we've tried to 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 use it to reconstruct uh, large scenes, and uh, um, so we had a lot of issues with uh, scaling and uh, overfitting to to the um, tra tra training sets. And in in, in our experience, um, if you want to ad adapt these methods to Truly, truly large scale on top, some kind of robustness. You, 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 you need to add some inductive bias, right? You, you need to put some expertise in it. And in, so far, it has not been possible to for, for us to to have a, like a something gen, gen, generic that can learn a, mo a reconstruction model that can be truly applied to a wide variety of uh, of, of scenes and to that, that can scale. So we we've developed a very recently a hybrid method between like uh, the classical graph cut visibility model and local uh, convolution in order to really build in um, some priors like we regularity priors and visibility information and, and things like this. So may, maybe I'll be proved wrong and uh, in, uh, in the next uh, round of conference, someone will, uh, will, will find uh, like an all purpose network to do uh, this kind of reconstruction and uh, the general as well. But so far my experience has been that um, for real life data, not clean uh, object level data sets, you need to put uh, some human priors and expertise into the architecture. How uh, this okay. answers uh, your question. So it's also like we should, uh, instead of encoding the object or the scene with uh, the same interfered, we, we should also like add and for some structure in the agenda to disentangle some like local geometry, local primitives and other uh, global context and then it might generalize beta, right? Uh, <laughs> that's not really the, the, the way the, the wind is blowing, right? Now I feel like a, a, in, in deep learning, a lot of people think that you should use like a, a very generic, uh, um, transformer-like method that can be applied to sound and images and point clouds and large scale uh, in everything at once. Um, and it seems prom promising, but uh, for all res uh, comput computational resources and uh, or operational uh, co constraints, we find it beneficial to, to, to add uh, this kind of expertise. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, thanks a lot. So one last question. We are running a bit out of time. Joachim, please go. Yeah, I tried to, thanks for a very interesting talk. And I particularly enjoyed the examples you showed, which were very nice. Um, I have a bit, I apologize. I don't have a very technical question, more of a popular question. And because you seem to be a bit of an expert in self-driving things, so, um, or, or at least you, you know, you're looking at the AI associated with that. And um, you mentioned LIDAR, and I had heard once Elon Musk say that, uh, you know, radar is dead and that, you know, he's going to basically just have a bunch of cameras on the car and it's going to drive and it's going to win over any radar based method because of just the sheer amount of data that he's collecting from all his cars. Is he wrong? And, you know, can you comment on this? So um, my expertise lies 
strictly beyond the, the mathematical aspect of all this, and I'm not a I'm not an engineer, and, uh, and so it's hard for me to to, to exactly say um, which is the best engineering solution to these problems. Um, so of course you can use a, a bunch of a, a bunch of cameras, uh, but this adds another step where you don't have three uh, D information. So you need to first reconstruct the three information. So this can be a source of errors, and then you need to process it. So this adds la latency and a source of error. With LiDAR, you directly have uh, uh, the, the true distances, and and modern LiDARs can do like a, a, a lot of rotation per second. So this gives you like a 360 view, uh, real time, real 3D. It's uh, basically it's re removing uh, um, removing a step. But so LiDAR works well at night. For images, it's not so true. But if if you have uh, like a mist or um, if it's raining, the LiDAR doesn't work so well. Uh, but it's really beyond my, my expertise, which is not in hardware. But I, I think LiDAR are um, very, very relevant. And for a long time, the issue was they were like uh, the price of a car. But now um, they're becoming much cheaper. There are also the solid state LiDAR, which don't, don't have uh, rotating parts. So they are a lot less fragile and uh, a lot faster, which I think is very exciting. Uh, as well, so I I don't know, but I, I don't think it's as so, clear cut as uh, Elon Musk says. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I mean, when he said that, of course, you know, there's many things he says that I'm very skeptical about. But you know, it, it occurred to me that it seemed like a very strange thing for him to say, where that would seem to be to use the three dimensional data would seem to be a natural pick, and you know, it, it seemed very counterintuitive to me. The statement that he made once. And anyway, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Okay, so although we are over time, Mauro, one last short question and then we finish. Okay, thank you. Super quick question. Um, in one slide, you showed like a scene of, I think it was like a point cloud of houses, right? Mm -hmm. And you, I saw that there were like bits and pieces missing, you know, exactly this one. So my question is super quick. Have people already attempted like super resolution for point clouds? Yes, super resolution uh, point clouds in painting uh, have, uh, are yeah, it's very straight straightforward. Basically, as long as you have a, an encoder or something that can uh, uh, where you can learn a meaningful representation of a point cloud on individual points, uh, a lot of things that have been uh, developed for. 2D images can be straightforward uh, to to apply. I think the the, the real methodological um, lock uh, that, that have been unlocked recently was really uh, learning uh, expressive representation. And now that it's been done, everything that can be done in images, like uh, GAN, for example, or, and uh, all, all the things are, are being applied to 3, 3D. And uh, it's, it's very, I think it's a very exciting time. Uh, a lot of uh, very interesting prospects. Okay, thank you. All right, so this brings us to the end. So thank you so much again, Luik, for being available and, and giving a talk today. I enjoyed it a lot, a lot of cool ideas and with a lot of technical detail too, which I appreciated. Mm -hmm. Hope um, some of the colleagues in astrophysics might find this inspiring also for their own work. And of course, Luik and me and others in the field are always open to discuss new adventures into new fields. So I also want to thank the audience for actively participating, asking a lot of questions. And I hope to see you soon again in one of or the other meetings. So until then, I enjoy lunch and then enjoy the weekend. So thank you so much and take care. <laughs>